What do we got? <laughs> this week on Kentucky Field. To wrap up 2021, we've picked out a few of our favorite segments from the past year. Oh, there we go. And we're bringing them to you right now. Best of 2021 Part 1 is coming up next on Kentucky Field. Such a pretty fish. Beautiful. This pond is plum floated with frogs. They're everywhere in here. <laughs> yeah, this is a good fish right here. Really good fish. Come here, girl. Hey, boy. That's a big rabbit. Nice job. Yes! Yes! <laughs> My first musk. <laughs> Here it goes! Boom! Oh, oh. Wow, that happened fast. Hello, and welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. This week, we're going to look back at 2021 at some of the segments that we enjoy producing the most. And first up, we're headed to Western Kentucky to jump in Kentucky Lake in search of catfish. <laughs> All right, so swim, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. We're down here on the banks of Kentucky Lake. This is the place that I've done a lot of fishing, but the type of fishing we're doing today is brand new to me. We're gonna be jumping in the water and, and hopefully grabbing some big flathead catfish by hand. Some people call it hogging, and some <laughs> people call it tickling, and some call it hand fishing, but it, it's all the same thing. I'm sure that people that you've told you you like to go out and noodle or, or hand grab catfish, they're probably like, oh my God, aren't you scared? Oh, it's, it's a defining <laughs> characteristic. I mean, you tell people you catfish noodle and, and it's one of the things they always remember about you and they always ask. And yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the appeals of it. You've been down there a while. Oh, yeah. oh there he is. There, there he is. <laughs> He's got it. Little what you, guy. What do you got there? Just a little channel cat. You can see where they get skinned up under those rocks and things. Oh yeah, that's the way to get started. You're just gonna turn him loose? And yeah, just turn him loose. and Find his way right on back down. Then we can go find something bigger. I've been noodling catfish, I guess 16 years. Um, as a matter of fact, my very first assignment as an outdoor rider was to go down to Mississippi and, uh, and try to noodle a catfish and write a story <laughs> about it. Those guys, they were pretty intense, pretty serious about it, but I learned how to do it. I caught a nice flathead and I was like, man, this is cool. I like big catfish, I always have. I've always been intrigued by them. And I, you know, I grew up, catching snakes and frogs and lizards and like a lot of country kids do. And I just like being outside doing that sort of thing. So we've been doing it about 15 years now and kind of a crew of family and, and buddies. And we, we just, we have a great time. We go every summer. Uh, oh yeah, I feel him. I, I feel the pad. Get ready. Here you go. <laughs> there he is. Kentucky actually has a season. It opens June 1st. It really gets going when the water temperature hits about 80 degrees. It's when the flatheads kind of start moving up into the holes and, uh, and stays good for a few weeks there. And honestly, by about the middle of July, we're, we're skinned up and worn out and ready to hang it up for the year anyway. <laughs> Check his gills and be sure nothing's bleeding and it's not. So fish is in good shape. He's in good shape. He got a little skinned up there on the on the rock. But That's kind of part of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can see on their back a lot of healed stuff. Yeah. yeah. And even his dorsal fin, he's he's wallowed that down, you know, where he's gotten up under there and, and dug, you know. So I tell you what, flathead catfish though are such... oh, they're, they're cool, aren't they? Look at that mouth. Look at that big old mouth and these little bitty eyes. They are a prehistoric looking fish. He'll yeah, find his way right back He'll in. He'll find his home. way right back in. I about guarantee you, you catch him in there tomorrow. So. <laughs> Well, we need to catch one about three times that size. So. Your wife actually enjoys doing this. She does, my wife and my son, Ants. We're an outdoors family. We hunt and fish for anything that's in season, year round. So we, we've been going out and doing this for a long time. Wouldn't, wouldn't have it any other way. So Ants is getting up here. This is a really shallow spot, which is absolutely perfect for a first timer or a young fellow like this. Uh oh, <laughs> he's in there, yep. He's in there. All right, you gotta get down in the water, belly down. There you go. Remember, get your, get your face in the water. Let's see my arms down in the hole. He's been going out here with us since two years old. You know, we've been putting him in the boat and, and taking him along. And it's a catfish. It might bite his hand, but it's not gonna. It's not gonna hurt him. He'll be okay. <laughs> he just came up and bit at his hand. <laughs> he bite your hand. Uh -huh. You okay? 
<laughs> Michelle and I have always hunted and fished together, and we just decided when he was born, we're just going to take him with us. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when he gets big enough to decide he doesn't want to go, that's fine. But he sure likes it. He, he loves it. Good job. So what'd that feel like, buddy? What'd that feel like doing that? That was pretty fun. Pretty fun? Did you feel the fish bite your hand? Yeah. It bit you one time, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Did it scare you a little bit? No? You're not scared of anything, You've are you? this a couple times before. <laughs> we release 99% of the catfish we catch doing this, and we almost always have to. And hey, we, we like to catch big catfish too, so yeah. we have an interest in not killing them. You know, it's a misconception that noodlers are going out there and cleaning everything they catch. They're sport fishermen, just like everybody else. A lot of people sink boxes for, for catfish noodling or drums, just like sinking structure for crappie, but it's, you know, it's for a single catfish. First time I've ever tried this, so uh, <laughs> we're here at this box and I got my feet right in the opening where I'm gonna go down and stick my arm in there and try to feel around and see if there's anything in there. What's the biggest thing you have to really be, watch out for? Everybody asks about the beaver, snakes, and turtles. <laughs> Every time. If I take somebody new, that's the first thing they ask. When you see turtles everywhere, you see some snakes on the bank and stuff, but so far as a turtle backing up in the holes, I mean, they, these holes that we're checking, they're, they're well underwater, they're under rocks and things. Didn't feel anything? No, nope, didn't feel anything. Sweep that stick around in there. A turtle has to breathe, and it's not a place that a turtle is going to back up into. Do you use the hook in or the other Yeah, end? the hook in. The thing that we stress, like we always go in groups, we never have somebody dive alone. I mean, the, the biggest real danger is obviously drowning. There's always the chance that you're going to get stuck underwater. I don't feel anything. Nobody home. So we always have somebody right there next to us when we dive. And most of the holes that we check, you can you can stand up. But there are a few that are over your head, and those you need to, you need to be particularly careful. A lot of what we check, honestly, are holes that we found in the banks, under rocks. It's taken us 15 years of looking, and we look continuously every summer. We've kind of built a circuit of areas that we check. Some days, this one will have a fish in it, and that one won't, and vice versa, but it's it's uh, it's still fishing. Getting ready to check another hole. This is completely different than the last one. It's not actually a man-made box. It's up under the bank, and it's got some concrete in it around it. So we're gonna go see what they've got. They said this hole has been known to hold some pretty good sized fish. So. <laughs> you already got one? Yeah, she gets real quiet. <laughs> I tell you what, this is this is something that you probably wouldn't want to do by yourself for safety concerns, but it also takes some teamwork sometimes to manipulate these fish in the best way to get them out. That's what we're seeing right here. But if you come to the left, I gotta push him back in. Yeah. Is he a mealy little sucker, Mama? Yes, he is, baby. He's biting the fur right now. Oh! Woo! Oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, no! pretty good channel cat, so. Yeah, he was biting, biting, biting. His, his little mouth wasn't big enough for my whole hand. <laughs> Nobody home? Nothing Damn. I feel. But I, I, I heard something. Did one of you guys? I had a stick under here. Oh, it might have been raking or something. You want to try this one? or? Yeah, I'll, I'll double check it. The other day there was a fish that kind of laid over to the right and he was kind of hard to, kind of hard to find. Be sure. It's just hard to get a feel for what you're feeling for. Uh, with oh, yeah. The, oh yeah. Fish? When you go in, take that stick and turn it to the right. Okay. And you hit a, the stick? It's a flathead. So once I locate where he's at with the stick, then I got to manipulate him. Yeah, manipulate yeah, you kind of have to manipulate him a little bit and you might, he'll, he'll probably bite that stick and you might be able to just kind of pull him. And as you do, swing him out and I would have your left hand in there ready to get him. All right. But you'll you'll know it if he gets on that stick. But yeah, go in there and go straight right. Straight right, yep. all right. Oh, I heard him, I heard him thump. Yeah. <laughs> We heard all that. <laughs> He's got the stick. <laughs> oh, did he take it away from you? No, I've got it right there at the mouth. I mean, we didn't even have a patent on that stick. <laughs> <laughs> He's on that stick. He should have him. Uh -oh. Hold up him. What do we got? <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, I had him there for a few minutes. I had him got him in and got my hand under there. <laughs> oh man. Well, I turned him loose, obviously. Yeah, we got, got to see him. So, <laughs> nice got work. him up out of there. <laughs> so, wait a minute, what have we got here? If we slow that video down, you'll be able to tell that I actually did have a catfish in my hand for a second. I got it out, and, and uh, you, you guys were told me to keep it close to my body. Well, when I went to stand up, I was trying to show it to the camera. Yeah. And I had it out about this far away and it just got loose. Oh yeah, but we all saw it and it's on tape. So. We were gonna turn it, <laughs> we were gonna turn it loose anyway. But that was pretty awesome. Yeah, that's pretty that cool. Was pretty, that awesome. was pretty cool. <laughs> You know, a 50 pound flathead is a handful. They can torque fingers and twist wrists. You can't just grab them by the jaw and let their tail go in open water because they're gonna beat you up pretty quick. It's so far down that the pressure builds. Try and hold your breath when you get down there. Mm. Like it takes me a little while to, I just can't stay down there long on this hole. You've got to respect the fish like oh, that. Yeah. But if you hold them the right way, if you can kind of get their head up close to your body and get their tail under control, and that's another reason why we dive in pairs a lot. If we've got a big fish, there's no shame in having a buddy grab his tail so he doesn't beat you to death. Oh, you got you? Oh my God. Oh, okay. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> a tag on him, too. He's got tag. <laughs> kind of for my own benefit of knowledge, you know, we've started tagging some of the fish, you know, with a zip tie and the dorsal fin or something, just to see. And we've had fish that we've caught three weekends in a row. Catch them, take a picture of them, let them go, and they go right back in there. <laughs> what, uh, what do you, now, what do you think that approximately poundage of this fish? My guess would be, Ants, what's this fish weigh? I'm about, let me look at it. About 11 pounds. 11 pounds, that ain't <laughs> bigger than that. Between that and, and catching a big flathead on a live bluegill that might swallow that hook, so far as that individual fish, this is not hurting him as much. It's one of those things that you do it with knowledge and respect of the resource. Yeah. This fish got just a couple little bitty, bitty spots on it, but it's, all in all, it's in great yeah. shape. Big old fat belly on it. You really can't understand the feeling of getting in there and feeling that fish strike until you actually use your hand for a right, lure. Exactly. We've taken a lot of new people, and that's, that's part of the fun. Like we like to take people. Just almost universally, it's not what they expect. Yeah. It's, it's not as scary, I guess, yeah. as people think it's going to be. But also, people are pretty surprised at how powerful those fish are. Oh yeah. There you go. Finally. <laughs> Finally got him to hit it. It's amazing to me how you, you kind of work in groups and as a family and as teams. It's a team sport. And it's more fun with a lot of people out oh, here. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think about that? Pretty fish, huh? Mm -hmm. I like his belly. I know, aren't they pretty? It looks like a little male. I think you're probably right. <laughs> hey, I'm gonna keep an eye out for some of your articles and keep up with what you're doing. And uh, I'm sure you and I will find some more trouble. For sure. Yeah, someday, right? yeah, I think it'd be a good time. Well, I enjoyed it, buddy. A lot so, of fun. Yeah, a lot of fun. Next up, we're headed to the mountains of beautiful eastern Kentucky to catch up with the biologist and talk about improving habitat. be doing prescribed burns today up here, try to improve some habitat, try to get rid of some autumn olive, get rid of some of the unwanted plants that we have and promote growth of native vegetation and some cool season grasses that will provide better forage for elk up here. So we're using a drip torch today to ignite the fuels on the ground and that consists of a canister which holds the mixed fuel which is a combination between diesel fuel and gasoline. There's a venting mechanism that's on the canister. This controls the flow rate of the fuel that's inside so that we can control how much fuel is being put on the ground. In order to ignite the drip torch, you saturate the wick, pour a little fuel on the ground and you can ignite that fuel which in turn will ignite the wick and you're ready to put fire on the ground. So this is a one unit of four that we're going to get to today. This is our largest unit of 200 acres. And what we're actually doing here right now is we're getting a lot of black. We're kind of on a downwind side of things. 
So we'll make sure we want to get a lot of black before we send uh, our head fire uh, up to this side of the unit. And basically what that's going to do is set back plant succession. We're trying to, we got a lot of non-native species in here like Teresa, Lespedeza, Autumn Olive. And we want to make sure that we keep our open areas open. In East Kentucky, we have a lot of areas that are predominantly wooded timber and a lot of wildlife benefit from these open areas. Fire is a necessity to do that. Each of our rigs have a drip torch, fuel for the drip torch. We've got two hand tools. Usually we've got a swatter and a fire rake. Each of the rigs we have 25 to 50 gallons of water on. What we got going on here, as you can imagine, on our reclaim areas, there can be gas wells or gas lines that uh, pop up out of the ground. So what we're doing right now, as you can see, we're blacking out to protect a gas line that pops up just in front of me here. What we're doing is we're blacking out all the way to a hard break on this side and then this side we're also going to a road that is a hard break just down below us. And we want this gas line to be protected at all costs. As you can see behind me, so, you know, what we're trying to do is knock the autumn olive back. You know, we've had a lot of autumn olives starting to come in. It is an invasive species and the seed source is hard to get rid of. So two of the things we're trying to do this spring is have a prescribed fire in order to kill what's above ground on the autumn olive. And then they may end up having to come back later as it starts to re-sprout and do something chemically or mechanically. This is our last unit for today. What you saw John doing, praying along the line, we're just laying a wet line just to kind of help us make sure we keep the fire where it's supposed to be. We've been really happy with what we've accomplished so far today and we're uh, excited to see um, how the elk respond to habitat management we've done here and promote some better forage for our animals. All right, so what we're doing right now, doing a mop up and what that consists of is crew members going around, running the whole unit to make sure that all fire is out. Fire is good for all wildlife, and I hope that this is able to continue throughout the southeast. We all know that getting outdoors is a lot of fun, but it can also be important to maintaining good mental health. So Nolan River, Nolan Lake, and White Bass just kind of go together. <laughs> I'm down here with a good buddy of mine, Dr. Josh Honecker, and we're in search of the white bass. Yeah, no land's known for it, and through the years we've fished for them a lot of times, and uh, it's an exciting, fun venture. Yeah, you know, I love fishing down here for these white bass when they get in the jumps. A couple things you'd look for is lack of wind and not a lot of boat traffic. So right here in the middle of the week, this is a really good time to get out here and try to catch them. You know, this time of year, if you just drive around enough, you'll see some schools. And they cycle in the years. You know, some years are better than others. And recently, it seems like they've been more active. This is a good thing to do to get out and catch big numbers of fish when they're on. It's a great way to get a kid or introduce a new person to fishing. It's highly active and you never know, you might catch a large mouth in the jumps as well. Absolutely, I fully suspect we probably will. It's supposed to be 96 degrees today. It's going to be stay. a get out early, finish early, but hopefully we start seeing some schools of jumping fish. I'm starting to see them right here, look out here. Yeah, right in front of us. As a matter of fact, we're going to turn the boat off and get ready because I fully suspect that any second we're going to start having fish on. I'm going to start off with a topwater bait just because it's so exciting to see them blow up on topwater. Yep. Oh, here we go. White bass number one. Now that's a little one. I'll tell you what. One thing, if you're throwing any type of lure like this that has trouble hooks, I tell you, a must is to have a set of pliers. If you've never eaten white bass, you know how to fillet these. They are fantastic. So incredibly good to eat. But we're gonna throw them back today, and this is a little bitty one, probably about eight inches. Oh, there's one. You got him? Yep. Yeah. That a better fish? Well, I don't know about better. That's a little bit better than the one I caught. Maybe a little bit. This lake has a enormous population of plus 15 fish, and I have caught them up to 18 inches in here, so. Uh, yeah, numbers and size, this lake's known for. Here's another. Bam, you got another one already. Even when the water quits boiling, you still catch them. 
Aren't they such a hard fighting fish for their size? No. Just like a smallmouth, you think they're twice their size. That one's got a blind eye. Oh, really? Yeah, that compared to that side. Look at this. Now, this is a spotted bass. You got a good chance of catching both largemouth, spotted bass, and white bass out here doing this. I've even caught bluegill, all kinds of opportunities. I'm gonna go to a swim bait approach here for a few casts. Ooh, there he is. Changed to a different tail spinner. This is a spin right. We'll probably talk a little bit more about it later. It's a unique history. A history very close to where we're at right here. Very Bowling close, Green, Bowling Green, Kentucky. Bowling Green, where Kentucky. Was, yeah. Look at there, a nice white bass. Look, here we go. <laughs> they're not really jumping like crazy, but they're here. Right. We're catching smaller size than I've been catching down here this year, but we're still early. That's where both hooks got this fish. Oh, up in front of us, big pod. There they are. Here we go. White bass, black bass, what do we think? Uh, like probably, a little white bass. Probably white bass. Here's one. That's probably an average no win white bass size. 12, 13 inches yep. probably. Just bigger than the ones we've been catching this morning. Oh, another spotted bass. See you, buddy. Josh, that little bait you're throwing, you're really catching them. Now that is one of the original tail spinners. It's called the Pettigo Spin, right? Yeah, so my grandfather was really good friends with Cecil Pettigo, the inventor of the lure, and they were big, avid fishing buddies. But then they quit making it in the mid, late 70s. And uh, honestly, the Pettigo Spin, right? And it sat idle for almost 40 years. And I found out the trademark had lapsed in 2008. I filed for the trademark, got it back in production, and on the back of the lure package, I put a picture of my grandfather and showed a big stringer of bass that he caught with it back in the 60s. It's just bringing back one of those oldies but goodies. It's a good presentation because they can see it, they can feel the vibration. It's a good way to go after them. A little bit better. Got one. You got one too? Yeah, this one's a little bit bigger. Look at that now, I'll tell you what, I've got a pretty good 14 inch fish. You've got one, looks yeah, like this, it's even better. This is our best double of the morning, no doubt. Look at that. Another quality white bass. People see us throwing all these white bass back in here, they're gonna think we're crazy. <laughs> so when you start seeing these fish out there jumping, what you're seeing is predatory fish. They come out and they get in schools, and almost like you've seen on TV where you've got sharks or whales that will circle. They will circle and gather that bait up and then it's like a feeding frenzy. They all go at the same time and they just start eating everything they can see. And they scatter the bait. It's a cycle that keeps going over and over and over. All right, there you go. Let's see if I can't get one on this top water. I love catching them on top water when I can get them to bite it. Oh, there we go. I tell you what, this little bigger plug, I've been catching bigger fish down here, and if you notice this bigger plug, the very first one I caught, look at that, it's probably 15 inch fish. There's one. Got him? Yeah. Oh, here we go. Oh man, I tell you what. I can't think of a better way to get kids outdoors than to get them out here and do this. You know, we're coming off of a crazy year, 2020 with COVID and no school and life as you know it has just been different. Being on the water and outdoors period just recharges you. It allows your emotional well-being to be optimized. Our kids, so many of them, just don't get any exposure to nature. You know, there's a book that you gave me a few years ago. It's called Last Child in the Woods. And it talked about something called nature deficit disorder. Kids that don't get to go out as much, they don't have as much energy and excitement about life, and they tend to have more anxiety and depression and struggle with emotional well-being. We do see an improve when they get outside. Oh, here we go. Well, Josh, this was a lot of fun. We got out here, got to catch some white bass and black bass. I didn't need your medical services to take a hook out of my hand. That's a good day. <laughs> it was a great morning, a beautiful morning. Couldn't have scripted any better. I'll tell you what, 
It's a great opportunity to get out here and reconnect with old friends, and this is a great way to get a kid off a computer out here casting and catching these fish. Yeah, just spend some time outdoors, connect with nature, and if you get tight lines every once in a while, it's all the better. Just watch those treble hooks. That's right. <laughs> <laughs>